I'm a big fan of web components because they're a web standard way to have custom functionality and encapsulated styles, but they do have some trade-offs. They're currently client-side only, so I only reach for them when I need to provide interactivity for users. And they also require a fair bit of setup. Most of the time, I just need to do some simple templating so I can reuse some HTML and styles in multiple places. This is where WebC comes in. It's a tool made by Eleventy, the static site generator, that makes single file web components possible with a ton of different rendering options. It's quickly become one of my favorite tools, and I want to explore all the different ways we can use WebC to render HTML, from simple templating all the way to full web components. To explore the different rendering options that WebC offers, I've got a bare bones Eleventy setup. This simply follows the getting started guide in the Eleventy documentation. WebC can be used as a standalone tool in any JavaScript project, but it's tailor-made as a plugin for Eleventy, so that's what we're going to use today. To get started with WebC and Eleventy, let's follow the documentation for installing it. The first thing we need to do is npm install the plugin. So in our terminal, we'll paste this in, and we can save this as a dev dependency. With that installed, we need to set up our configuration to add the plugin to Eleventy. I like to do this in an 110.config.js file. We'll paste that in. And that's all the setup that's required, so we can add a WebC file now. I'm going to add an index.webc file. And inside of here, WebC at its core is just HTML. So we can expand a typical HTML starter. Let's say this is WebC rendering options as a title. And we'll add an H1 with the same content. Now we're ready to run 11e to process this WebC file. Let's create a quick script for that in our package.json. So this will be our start command. And what we'll need to say is npx at 11e slash 11e. And we'll do this with the serve flag so we can get a live preview. And we'll do an incremental build as well. We can delete this test script. And if everything is set up right, when we run npm run start in our terminal, we should see that it wrote one file and we have the server running at localhost 8080. If we look in this new site folder, we'll see that it generated an index.html file. And this shows this is really just HTML under the hood. So WebC will process anything you write into HTML. You can see that these are basically identical on the left and right. And if we open up our preview in the browser at localhost 8080, we'll see that h1 renders as expected. So as I mentioned, WebC renders out as normal HTML, and it can be used at every level, from simple components all the way up to the layouts that compose your website. Most of the time, you just need to reuse markup across your website. So let's look at how to do simple HTML templating. Before we begin, I'm gonna add some configuration options so we can specify which folder we wanna add our components to. This will be done in our return object, and we'll say that the directory property we're going to target the includes key, and that'll have a value of underscore components, which will be the name of our folder. Now we can add a folder called underscore components. And inside of here, let's add an initial component. Let's call it simple templating.webc. Inside of here, let's simply add an h2 and say simple templating component. Now, before we add it to our index.webc file, let's make sure we restart our server since we made a configuration change. Now, in our index.webc file, we can include it by using the name of the component. And it's important to note that all custom elements have a hyphenated name and require a closing tag, so they can't be void or self closing elements. And as soon as we added it, you'll see that it renders out as an H2. So, whatever we put inside of our WebC file, will simply be output without any of the custom element tags by default. So our first option with simple HTML templating has the benefits that we're able to reuse markup and it doesn't render a custom element tag, but there are some limitations. Mainly, we can't use scope styles or JavaScript. The next option that we have at our disposal is the ability to replace an element with the components markup. Let's make a new component and let's call this replace element.webc. And let's add another heading and let's just say replace element component. In our index.html file, instead of writing out the custom element tag, we can actually write any HTML element we want and simply say webc is, 
with the name of the component as a value. So we'll say replace element here. And you'll see that this renders out to an H2 as well. Now checking on our preview, we see the H2s appear as expected. And at first it's confusing why this would be advantageous because this is identical in functionality to simply including the name of the component. But where this is necessary is in the head element. The head element can't accept custom elements as children. So if we wanted to include a component that renders out our meta title or meta description, for example, we need to use this technique with this webc is attribute. Just to show that, let's add a new component called meta title.webc. And we'll replace our title element with one that comes from this component. So we'll say webc rendering options. Give that a save. And instead of our title element here, I'll actually say webc colon is meta title. And then we can have an empty tag contents. And on the right, you'll see that this renders out the title as we originally wanted. So everything is working as expected. So the benefits and limitations of this approach are very similar to the simple HTML templating. We can reuse markup and it doesn't output a custom element tag, but it also works in the head element. And we have the same limitations that we can't use scope styles or JavaScript. So what if we want to use scope styles? The easiest way in WebC is to do something called overloading an HTML element. When we overload an HTML element, we replace it entirely with a WebC component without rendering a custom element tag. A common use case for this is something like a footer that gets reused across a website. So instead of writing our footer manually, let's add a new component called footer.webc. And when we name a WebC component the same as a native HTML tag, we're explicitly opting in to overloading or overwriting a native HTML element. The actual web standards for custom elements requires that they have a hyphenated name explicitly so we can't do this. But WebC allows us to opt into this behavior, which gives us some new functionality. So inside of here, we'll simply write footer and then let's add an H2 to say footer component. I mentioned that this allows us to add scope styling. So let's target this with a style tag. And what we can say is WebC scoped as the attribute. And inside of here, we should be able to target our H2 directly. You'll see that these styles are gonna be scoped so we can freely use element selectors without any worry of these styles leaking out to other H2s. And since we added scope styles, we'll need a way to include those in our HTML. Leveny will automatically bundle these so we can simply include it with an at raw attribute, the get bundle function, and pass in a string of CSS. Lastly, we need to tell WebC to keep the style element with a WebC keep attribute. And once we add that, you'll see that our output, we have the footer that we wrote that includes the H2 and also this hashed class name. And this hashed class name is the key for that style scoping. You can see that that basically acts as the parent selector for this footer component. And that allows us to freely use element selectors instead of having to write class names for everything. If we look at our preview, you'll notice that just the H2 inside of the footer component is now red. Overloading an HTML element gives us some other opportunities, such as making enhancements to how normal elements work. A good use case for something like this is the image tag, where regardless of what the image contains, we should always have an alt attribute. The alt attribute should be empty when the image is decorative, and when it contains meaningful content, we need a good description we add here. So we could create an image component that overloads this element to always require the alt attribute. So to recap overloading an HTML element, we can enhance native elements and replace them across our website. We can also use scope styles and it still doesn't output a custom element tag. The limitations of this is that we have to commit to overriding every instance of a native element and we still can't use JavaScript. So what if we want to use scope styles, but we don't want to commit to overriding every instance of a native element? This might be useful in the case of something like a header at the top of the page that might vary depending on where you are on the website. So let's create a new component and let's call it custom header.webc. And inside of here, we're gonna write a header tag and we're gonna set a webc root attribute to override. What this will do is say, whatever the custom element is, we're gonna override that with this element specified here. In this case, we expect it to render out the header element. So inside of here, we can say custom header component. And just to show that we can still do scope styles, let's add a style tag. Again, we'll add the WebC scoped attribute. 
and we can select that P tag and say that the font size is 2 rem. Now in our index.webc file, we can include custom header. In our output, you can see that we've rendered out a header tag with the P element and those scope styles. And what's cool is that header tag overrode the custom element that we used. So with this approach, we don't have to commit to overloading every instance of a native element. We can use scope styles and it doesn't output a custom element tag, but we still have the limitation that we can't use JavaScript. So far, all of these approaches have had static content, but what if we need something dynamic, like data that we fetch from an API or calculating something like the current date? Let's add a new component called dynamiccontent.webc. With this component, we'd like to output the current year. The first thing we need to do is add a script tag, and this will have a webc type attribute of JS. Inside of this script tag, we're gonna say const current date is equal to a new date object. And this component is something called a JavaScript render function. These render functions will automatically return an HTML string at the end of the function. So in this case, we wanna say that this is dynamic component from the year, and we'll use the template string syntax to access current date dot get full year. And then we'll close out our h2. What's cool about this is 11 e will run this JavaScript render function on the server and process the results out to static HTML. So this won't require any JavaScript bundling or any JavaScript that's shipped to the user. The limitation to this is we can't add any client side functionality. In our index.html file, let's go down here and add dynamic content and give that a save. If we check our output, you should see that dynamic component from the year 2023 appears. And this is again, something that's processed on the server side. So we have still no JavaScript included in our output HTML. So with this approach, we can use server side JavaScript. We also have access to 11E's data cascade. This also allows for more advanced templating with looping and variables, and it doesn't output a custom element tag. In terms of limitations, we can't have any client side functionality. And we also can't add any styles. Lastly, we have to author HTML in a template string so we don't get any syntax highlighting or autocomplete. Up to this point, everything we've done hasn't rendered out a custom element tag. And this is great because we just have standard HTML. So when do custom elements come into play? Let's add a new component called custom element.webc. By default, WebC will output the custom element tag anytime there are scope styles or JavaScript. Now, as we explored, there are multiple options for achieving scope styles without outputting a custom element tag. But if we don't use these approaches, it will output the custom element tag. Custom elements are mainly useful for more advanced templating with things like if, else if, else, and for attributes that 11e provides. 11e will process these templates on the server side and statically render the output. And it is possible to add JavaScript, but only global JavaScript. We can't add any JavaScript that's scoped to this component, so I don't recommend this approach. But if we are gonna add JavaScript, we need to add the JavaScript bundle. So we'll add a script tag with type module, and we'll use that same at raw attribute, calling the get bundle function with a string of JS. Since we haven't added any JavaScript yet, you'll see that it doesn't make its way into the final output but we're set up in case we need to add any global JavaScript. To demonstrate when 11e will output a custom element tag, let's write something simple. Div tag, and let's have a paragraph inside. And this will say custom element component. And then we'll use some scoped styles with the webc scoped attribute. Target that paragraph element, and we'll say its color is gonna be green. Now, if we include custom element, in our index.webc file, we'll see the scoped styles appear, and we're actually rendering out the custom element tag. To demonstrate some of the more advanced templating options that we have at our disposal, let's add a webc if attribute here. And we're gonna set the value to be true. So this should always render out. If we duplicate this line and set its value to false, this will never render. So let's say it doesn't render. And if we give this a save, we'll see that the first paragraph renders because it's always true, while the second one does not, and we still don't have any output JavaScript. 
So to recap, custom elements allow us to use more advanced templating while authoring normal HTML. We can also use server-side or global client-side JavaScript, as well as scope styles. But there are better options for scope styles without outputting a custom element tag. Custom element tags can introduce some challenges with layout and semantics, since we are adding a new HTML element around the content that we want to render. And lastly, we still can't use any scoped client-side JavaScript to add new functionality or interactivity. So if we do need client-side functionality, this is where we're going to finally build a real web component. Let's add a new component that we'll call webcomponent.webc. And web components have a lot more setup involved. The first thing is we will need the script tag to include our JavaScript bundle in our index file. Web components can be a little tricky to author by default, but webc allows for single file components. What this means is we can simply type out the HTML that we want, as we've done with all the other WebC components we've built. So let's add a button with a type of button, and let's say log to the console. Next, we need to define this as a custom element. So we're going to open up a script tag. Inside of here, we're going to write window.customElements and call the define method. This method takes two arguments. The first is the custom element name, so this will be web component hyphenated. And the second is the actual class of our component. So class extends HTML element. Now with web components, we can make use of lifecycle methods that allow us to detect when the component has been mounted or moved from the DOM. We're going to make use of the connected callback lifecycle method. And this is when the component is mounted to the DOM. Inside of here, we need a reference to the button that we created. So we'll say this referring to the web component dot query selector. And here we can make use of something called colon scope to query select from the root of this web component. And we're looking for our button element. So with our button, we'd like to add an event listener or a click event. And then we'll run this callback function. And this will simply console dot log and it'll say hello from the web component. And in our index file, we'll lastly include web hyphen component. What we'll see in our output is again a custom element tag. We'll have the button that is in the light DOM of the web component. And we'll see that our script tag is missing. And that's because I forgot to include the webc keep attribute. So once we add that, we'll see that our JavaScript is included as well. So once we include that, we'll spot our bundled JavaScript. So we'll see that we're defining our web component as we wrote. We have the connected callback lifecycle method, which is selecting your button, adding an event listener, and should hopefully allow us to log to the console with client side interactivity. So, back to our preview, I'm going to open the console here. And if we click this button, we'll see that we have client side interactivity. So, with this approach of single file web components, we have the full web component spec at our disposal. We can make use of both the light and shadow DOM as we need. We can use scope styles, and we can also have scoped client side JavaScript. For any client side interactivity. The limitations are that custom element tags, again, introduce some challenges with layout and semantics. We also have to think through progressive enhancement and hydration. Because these web components only work on the client side, we have to consider what happens if JavaScript doesn't load and progressively enhance the user experience. So, as a final recap, if you want basic HTML templating, we can use the simple HTML templating approach or replace an element with a components markup. If we want scope styles, we can overload an HTML element. We can also have scope styles without using a custom element or opt into a custom element tag. If we only need server side JavaScript, we can use render functions or a custom element. And lastly, if we need client side JavaScript, that's where we'll opt into a full web component.